Yeah, I can see it. Okay, perfect. Okay, so I was thinking about giving a, 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 a name for the club and to make something which is at least positive uh, with the COVID-19, the bioinformatics club should have this thing. <laughs> not, not the test, should be positive. Okay, this is not one. Oh, I can't see my screen because of that. Okay. Okay, so the first question, I think what we have to discuss is what is bioinformatics? If you, if you go on any kind of uh, university website, even the Cambridge University website, there will be, I'm sure, at least one or two uh, job advertisements. They are looking for bioinformaticians. Uh, so in, I think in many people, this is a profession. In, in, in my view, it's not a profession. I, I don't uh, handle myself as a bioinformatician. I am doing bioinformatics, but I am a biologist or a zoologist or a geneticist or a structural biologist, but not a bioinformatician. Uh, it's, is it a skill? It's, it's definitely a collection of skills and we will speak about this uh, today, later, what are the, the basic skills uh, you have to have to do bioinformatics. Uh, it's, is it a knowledge? Uh, there are things you have to know, there are things you have to uh, understand and you don't have to be fear of uh, to do bioinformatics and especially the things with computers. But in my view, bioinformatics is just a tool. It's the same kind of tool as a PCR machine or the same as a next generation sequencer. Uh, sometimes it's a bit more sophisticated, but sometimes it's, it's actually very simple, simple like a PCR machine. Uh, so the, in the ne on the next slides, I would like to say my opinion who should do bioinformatics. It's only my opinion, so please <laughs> handle it as like that. So, so as, as the word is composed of two things, biology and informatics, uh, the two main source of, of people who would do bioinformatics is the biologist, or of course, physicists, chemists, chemists as well, or the informaticians, or somebody like an informatician, like mathematician or an engineer. But the main problem with bioinformatics is that if we handle bioinformatics as a tool, so it's sitting between the question and the answer, then the, the question has to be a biological question. It, it always has to be a biological question. So in my view, it's, it's much better to train a biologist to do some informatics. And you will see, it's, I think it's way much easier then try to uh, ask an informatician to understand biology. So, so I think for, for biologists, it's, it's a bit strange and frightening for the first few years <laughs> when doing bioinformatics, uh, just because there are so many new things, so many new methods, so many new uh, approaches we have to learn. Uh, but for the informatician, who knows very well the middle part, who knows how to, how to make an algorithm, how to use a program, how to compile a script. For them, uh, the, the, the right and left hand side will be always a bit confusing because they just don't really understand the biology behind it. Of course they can learn, but they already learned quite a lot at the university for for their profession. So I'm not sure that they are always open to learn. So, in, and, and the other problem is that uh, bioinformatics and informatics is advancing a lot. There are many new algorithms, many new ways to do bioinformatics or informatics. So it's, it's, it's evolving in its way. And also biology is evolving. I don't have to say that, you know, we have millions of or, or thousands or hundreds of thousands of new genomes uh, compared to what we have had like 10 or 15 years ago. So we have much more data, we have much deeper biology on one side and we have much more sophisticated informatics on the other side. So the gap is, is actually opening and, and widening continuously. 
So that's why we have more and more bioinformaticians, or at least more and more biologists who are open to do bioinformatics. Yeah, if you have any questions during the talk or uh, the presentation, just feel free to uh, interrupt, please. So uh, I try to collect the three main approaches, how you can do bioinformatics. And I will try to explain why I think uh, which one is better or which one is good in one way and which one is uh, a bit worse in, 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 in the other way. So version one is data processing with any kind of software. So in, in this case, the question is not always well formed. You don't always have an exact biological question, but you have a huge amount of data. Sometimes you have your own data, which was collected like five or 10 years ago, and you just had a new idea or just a new algorithm, a new program package came out and you want to reanalyze your data, which is completely valid. It's, there is nothing wrong with this. Uh, but usually there, isn't, there is no well-formed hypothesis like we usually have, for example, an experiment, an experimental setting. So uh, that's, that's the left-hand side. Uh, the, the data can come from, from very different sources. Again, you can reanalyze your data, but you can also include other people's data. You can use databases to download data. And, and the main focus is in the middle in this case. So it's on the bioinformatics. Uh, you are usually using multiple software in this approach. So it's, uh, it's usually quite sophisticated how you build up your bioinformatics pipeline in these cases, because if you think about, you are usually, usually are, you're analyzing an already used data. So the data was collected for some reason. It was analyzed uh, probably in a simple way before but you have an idea that you can analyze that data in a different way, which means that you probably have to use some, some more sophisticated method for that. Uh, there are many scientists who have their, their own favorite algorithm or software. They like using hidden Markov models and they will use hidden Markov models more, or they like to use Bayesian programming or artificial intelligence, and they are using that kind of approaches to reanalyze the data and uh, and say something else or say something more that was already extracted from the data. Uh, it's always it's also a, a trend that that people like using uh, like like doing almost the same uh, uh, software or or approach someone did before, but with a different algorithm. So that's typical when, when, when something came out that, okay, there is a new deep neural network. Let's find out if we can find plasmids with a higher accuracy with that kind of software. And sadly, sometimes that's, that's the fourth point in the middle. Sometimes researchers just doing it because they have a software package or an algorithm in their mind and they apply it for every available data sets, which is again valid, but it's not too open-minded. Uh, so what's the answer? So the question wasn't, wasn't very strictly biological. Uh, the answer can have some uh, biological relevance, but many times you don't, have, you don't have a good result. You can have a p-value, you can have an improvement on, on a previous method, but uh, the efficiency is not too high in this case. Uh, just because it's, there is nothing uh, uh, which ins um, ensure that, that you, can, you will have a, a real a biological result out of this. So if we wait the, the three sides or three uh, stages of, of, of a uh, project like this, then clearly, the focus is on is in the middle of this one. Uh, in terms of output per money ratio, this is usually very high. 
even if you didn't find something which is groundbreaking in biology, you can just simply uh, uh, publish your method in a, in a bioinformatics paper. But if you look at the, the left-hand side, which is usually the question and, and the sample collection is usually the, the most expensive part, uh, then it's, it's, a, it's a quite a cheap approach uh, for bioinformatics. The next one is when, when we have a hypothesis. Hy hypothesis. So it's, it's very similar to what we do in the lab. Uh, so we have a well-defined question. We are doing targeted sampling. We are driven by our age zero. And, and usually we are generating novel data. Uh, the good thing with these kind of projects is that when you generate data and you analyze it to answer your question, it doesn't mean that, that you used up all the potential in the data. So again, it's, it's completely valid to do a project like this, but you are probably wasting a, a bit of potential from, uh, from the data you are collecting. But in the meantime, you are keeping yourself on the track, and this will be this is one of the, the the best thing in this kind of approach in bioinformatics. You know we want you you have to do you know what kind of software packages you have to use and you know what kind of result you will uh, you can uh, extract from these. So usually you are using single or simple uh, pipelines in, in this case. It's very easy to learn and very easy to reproduce. So this is, I think, uh, what is the easiest to learn for someone who is coming from the uh, experimental side, especially because the whole planning and the whole structure of the project is very similar to what we are doing in the lab. Uh, we very often get biological, relevant biological answers, of course, out of this, but I think that the main drawback of this approach is it's, it's low efficiency uh, because usually there is much more in the data you are collecting than you can you are uh, publishing or extracting if you just stick to one uh, question or one hypothesis so in terms of weights there is much more weight on the question and the answer in this case and a bit less on bioinformatics but it's very good to uh, to transitioning from, from experimental science to, to bioinformatics. Uh, yeah, the paper money ratio is very low. So you are spending a lot of money on, on establishing your uh, project and, and collecting your data. Uh, and usually you have just one or maybe two papers at the end. So the version three, I gave it to this, this quite silly name. I'm not sure it's, it's, it's okay, but it's a kind of balanced curiosity. Uh, so you don't have one well-defined hypothesis, but you have a biological problem and you are looking for uh, answers for that problem. Sometimes you are doing sampling, you are doing supplementary sampling. And in many cases you have these kind of questions out of version two. So when you finish with a project with the focused approach, then you realize at the end, okay, but I can ask more. I can ask other different biological questions. The difference between this one and that one is that you are continuously remain open-minded. And this is the trap in this method, because if you remain open-minded, you can just go after every idea you have. And for three, two, three years, you are just coming out with new ideas, uh, but don't publish actually. So that's, that's the, the, the biggest danger in this kind of version that, that it's very easy to, to float on, on, on the surface of the huge amount of data you have uh, without actually finishing anything. Uh, the, the, there is a point in the question, uh, under the question uh, box, which is data consolidation. So in many cases, you are doing a project like this because you 
you realized after a bioinformatics project that you missed something in, in that previous project and you just want to do some supplementary sampling to, to answer that particular question uh, or just to, to make your data a bit more uh, informative. Uh, as you see, the, the whole middle part is much more flexible, much more fluid. So there is no predefined software packs uh, in this one. Usually you are uh, just, uh, you have your intuition what, what kind of pathways you are choosing and you are looking for, uh, for the solutions in, in, uh, on that area. This one requires the most experience, I have to say. In biology, in biology and in bioinformatics as well. So in, in the first version where we analyze the data, then a, someone with a strong informatics background can do that easily. The second part, as I said, is, is very uh, suitable for an experimental biologist who just want to uh, uh, taste the uh, bitterness of bioinformatics. Uh, Why in this one you have to uh, understand the biology and the bioinformatics as well very well because you can only ask relevant biological questions if you know biology but luckily it doesn't have to be in one person and that's why teamwork is there with an exclamation mark uh, in this case teamwork is one of the most important thing I think uh, in terms of answer it's very close to the to, to version 2 I think in many cases you have very nice relevant biological answers but clearly it is much more efficient than the focused focused uh, bioinformatics and you usually get much more answers than you expected before and which is i think almost true for all bioinformatics uh, projects and it, it usually triggers new questions very easily sometimes more than you had before so I think this is also balanced in terms of weight, uh, which part is uh, uh, for uh, has a has a bigger focus, and also the paper money ratio is, is like medium. So the next thing I would like to say, and I think I will come back to this in many future uh, meet, uh, meetings as well specifically when we will discuss a question or when we discuss a method is is what you have to avoid when you do bioinformatics uh, so the first thing that you shouldn't use different methods just to get a better p-value there are there will always be another method another algorithm which will give you a good or a better p-value but that's not the reason why you should choose that. If you choose the other method because you think that it's biologically more suitable for answering your question, that's okay. If it gives you a better p-value, then you are lucky. But don't sit down and try 10 different methods and choose the one which will give you the, better, the best p-value. I, I think this is very important because I saw that, saw this many times before in, in bioinformatics works, even in published works. I mean, in works which, for example, sent to reviewers, but then of course rejected. Uh, you can see this. Uh, be very careful if you build up long chains of algorithms. Uh, you have to, you have to know all the, the, the software you are using and, and if you have to Put them after each other which means that you have your initial raw data you put it into method one the output is going into the input to method two which outputs going into the input of method three you are losing biology in each steps and and you have to know how much biology you are lo use, uh, losing because at the end you can just again end up with a nice p-value but without any biological sense at all so so this is very important sometimes you have to do it because sometimes the whole pipeline is just so complicated but if you have to do you have to 
know all the steps and you have to know what kind of loss you have to count with uh, in each step. Uh, you have to be very careful when you uh, validate one method with the other. So an example from the from the lab, if you if you want to see some uh, expression, gene expression, then you can start with a, a hybridization method or an RNA-seq. And if you see that the RNA on the RNA-seq you have a few genes that are highly expressed, then you can validate those results with a targeted qPCR. This is working very well in the lab. Uh, it's not always the same in bioinformatics. Uh, the, the two things that can happen is that you are using a, a method which name differently, but having exactly the same back, backbone in, in the software. And you are just actually replicate what you did with the first method. So it's not a validation. The other thing is that you are using a method which is using a completely different approach, a completely different algorithm, which means that it will answer in a different way. So it's again, not really good for validation. Uh, so you have to be very careful with this. Uh, default settings, almost all of the bioinformatics software you can you download, just let's go with a very simple BLAST. If you run BLAST in command line, you will get a nice text output uh, where you can see your homologous genes or homologous proteins. Uh, the default BLAST output is, is completely useless if you want to go forward and if you want to parse that output, for example, in a, in a, in a program. So always go and read what kind of options you have for a program. Try to understand what is that minus N flag, what is that minus O flag, uh, and, and use them if you need. Uh, yeah, this don't let yourself being distracted. This is actually uh, connected to the version three, the uh, balanced curiosity approach of, uh, of bioinformatics. That's what I said that if you, if you have a huge amount of data, you will always have something very interesting in that. Just ask Mark and my last two years. Uh, so, yes, you have to be very open-minded. You have to see the potential in your data, see the potential in your, in your project, but you also have to stick to do what you have to do and finish at least one of the, the sub-projects. And again, going back to the teamwork, never isolate yourself. It's uh, sometimes, you know, IT people and nerds like like people who do bioinformatics are, uh, I mean, are sometimes isolating themselves. Not like now when we have to isolate ourselves, of course, but, but when you have the chance, just go and speak with experimental people and ask, ask their opinion in your in your biological questions. And yeah, don't be afraid to switch between working styles. This is going back to the very first version where, where I, I said that there are many people who just like using the same algorithm for uh, analyzing huge well, or very different data sets. Just be open for new methods and new working styles as well. If it's a new programming language, then it's a new programming language because sometimes it's worth to do uh, to learn a new programming language. And also the, the three different versions. Uh, so I, I tried to collect a few main differences between the in vitro versus in silico uh, projects. Uh, this table started as a, as a with four rows and then I just uh, had more and more to add. So in, in in vivo and in vitro studies, when you write a grant, you usually uh, have to state what kind of methodology you will use. Uh, so it's there is a flexibility, but not too much flexibility. 
in, in, in the methods usually in, in the lab. In silico, it's, it's very flexible. Uh, if I say something wrong for the left-hand side, please just correct me. <laughs> uh, so so for, the, for the bioinformatics, the methods you can use, it's, it's very flexible. And, and yeah, sometimes have to completely replan what you do. Uh, usually the in vivo and in vitro studies takes quite a long time in uh, during the methods phase Com uh, collecting samples having you know like incubation times always this is much better for the bioinformatics so first of all it's not you who do the, the calculations the work it's the computer who is doing it uh, and second, we have quite good computers nowadays, so it's usually quite quick. Uh, because you, because, and now I'm going to the third point, because in in vitro, in vitro studies, you have your hypothesis, then because of this, you, you usually know what kind of result you uh, will have. So it's, you, you already know what kind of interpretation or evaluation will you do. In, in bioinformatics, you can just generate a lot of results, a lot of temporary results, a lot of graphs and, and figures. But it usually requires a lot of post-processing to find out which one is really relevant if you are not hypothesis-driven. The next point is extremely important. In, in, in the lab, you are using replicates. You are doing the same kind of uh, experiment three times, five times, you are using five or six or seven animals for one group. It's very hard to translate replicates to the bioinformatics world. Uh, and this is very, again, a, a very dangerous part of bioinformatics. Many people think that, okay, if that bioinformatics software, which is almost always true, gives you the same answer every time you run it, because it's a computer program, then it has to be true. No, it's not true. Uh, but instead of doing replicates, you have to uh, be sure that you know what, what are the uh, specificity, sensitivity values for that kind of method. So you have to know what is the uh, uh, failure rate of, of of, of that kind of method. Uh, again, you can you can use different approaches and try to use different software packages to, to like simulate replicates, but this is not something that I would suggest. Uh, there are programs where you can introduce noise. That's not bad, but it, it's a bit artificial again. So you can you can uh, introduce like a Gaussian noise and then you will get a different result. Or there are programs, for example, in molecular modeling, when you, when you start uh, your, your modeling with a different uh, kick uh, on, on the molecule. Uh, the next thing is the sample. You know that in the lab, uh, handling the sample is very important. If you uh, don't isolate iron RNA quick enough, it will degrade. If you don't uh, freeze your sample, then the cells will die or something like that. It's, it's much easier in bioinformatics. The sample is the data, so it will remain the same forever. But as you try to save your samples and try to uh, uh, preserve your samples in the lab, in the freezers. You should do the same with your data. It's very important to know that your data is in a safe place. It's back up, backed up, and it's also in a well-organized uh, structure. So you, if you want to go back to your data, it's easy to go back. Uh, in, in the lab, when you get a, a good result, <laughs> It's usually a, a real biological result. 
in, in bioinformatics, it's very rarely a, have a, a, a real biological sense. It's much more a predictive result, uh, which can be interpreted, which can be validated by uh, in the lab, or uh, which can be used. The, the best example is if, if I run BLAST on my metagenomic assemblies uh, and find antimicrobial resistance genes, it doesn't mean that they have antimicrobial resistance, these bugs. If Ibrahim is doing the same in the lab and observe on the plate that there was antimicrobial resistance, that's a real biological result. Mine is only just a prediction that there should be antimicrobial resistance in that bug. Uh, the next thing is that in the lab, you are almost always just using your work. Of course, you are using programs. You can use databases. You can compare your uh, uh, results, and you have to compare your results to the people results. But but you don't really use other people's uh, product. I mean, you can you can ask for constructs, of course. But the main body of your results is coming from your from your own work. In, in bioinformatics, there are many cases when we are just using publicly, publicly available data. If, you, if we do a comparison, build up uh, uh, a tree, we are involving known reference sequencing, of, of course. Uh, I got a question in the meantime. Okay, so if a bioinformatic tool only predicts the presence of a gene, such as an AMR gene, why then do we have to rely on them so much? Uh, because it's much cheaper, it's much quicker, it's much simpler to do it, and because we can do it for thousands of genomes at the same time. You can't do this with the same kind of efficient efficiency in the lab. But if you really want to validate something like this, then you have to do it in the lab. I think uh, I, will, I will come back to this question, I think in the next or one of the next slides, how the experimental uh, part and bioinformatics can, can communicate with each other. Uh, okay, uh, in, in terms of comparability, uh, applicability, and reproducibility in the lab. These, these again, something what you don't really have in, in silico uh, work. So what I'm speaking now is that, can you, can you compare an RNA-seq with a qPCR? Not really. You can compare two RNA-seq experiments, but you cannot really compare two very different approaches. And you have to know this when you do an in vivo or in vitro study. In, in, in the insulin cohort, it's much more about if you have to choose uh, the, the right method, you have to be careful about other kind of uh, properties of these methods, like specificity, sensitivity. You have to understand what the block curve means. Uh, and again, you have to uh, keep in mind that the rock curve has a special shape that maybe a different threshold, you will get a more relevant biological answer than uh, should have been given by the default settings of that software. Uh, yeah, the, uh, the next point is, is much more about the person who is doing the wet lab. I think in the wet lab, you have a lot of failures and you have to tolerate your, the failures a lot of times there is a chance that half year or a year of work has to go into the bin and you have to start from the beginning. Uh, this is happening very rarely in bioinformatics because you have your temporary or, or your final results much, way much faster. You can have a complete garbage, but you only spend two weeks to make that, com that, that, that garbage, which is not that bad. But in bioinformatics, you have to be very careful with your results and criticize your results always because, uh, as I 
said before, it's very easy to, to make a, new, a nice p-value. You have to really uh, be sure that the p-value is true and it has a biological meaning. Uh, in case of, of in vitro and in vivo studies, price is usually a significant factor. You, if you have to do sequencing, then, then you usually have money for 10 or 10,000 sequencing on, sequencings only, not more. So you have to design your projects with the money in the first place. In the in silico work, it's usually the time, uh, not only the time you are spending with, or the computer spending with, with the calculations, but also the time you have to spend on post-processing your results. Of course, there is also money where if you're a PI, you have to employ someone who can do bioinformatics. Okay, and this is now the question, uh, the, the, the slide, which is maybe a bit more answer to Gino. So, so how we can combine experimental projects with bioinformatics, and I think this is one of the most important parts for all of you who came here to learn a bit more of bioinformatics as an experimental scientist. So I think one of the, the most straightforward way is that we have we want to validate uh, one with the other. It's usually the predictive bioinformatics that is validated by the experiment. So if you predict AMR genes and and in 100 strains, you will find two only, which is a bit strange or a bit unexpected. Then you can work with those two. Uh, the other uh, part is pre-filtering. So Thomas is here from the RBC London, as I said. We have a project at the moment running uh, where there is a, a genetic disease in cats. Uh, they know the gene, they know the domain in the protein, which uh, has a defect in this disease, and they know a few mutations, but they actually designed a CRISPR uh, system to destroy that domain in many different ways. So they have now a lot of different cell lines with a lot of different mutations, but they of course don't have the resources to, to phenotypically uh, uh, characterize all of these cell lines. So they asked me and then I involved uh, Thomas as a PhD student to do some pre-filtering to try to predict the effect of the mutations on the structure of the domain. And then if we say that, okay, from this 100, we think that this 15 is very interesting, they will go forward with those 15. Uh, Bioinformatics is very good to generate biological questions. So when we analyze a huge amount of data and we find something interesting, then it's, it's a good way to, uh, to continue that kind of project with, uh, with Interlab. And again, a question, Seb. Uh, predict where, where the Seb, you can just turn on your microphone. Sorry, I was replying to Kioma's question. Um, I didn't know uh, you were talking about it. So don't pay attention to it. <laughs> so was, so there is no question then? No, because Kioma was asking uh, if a bioinformatic tool only predicts the, the, um, the presence of a gene such as an AMR gene. Why then do we have to rely on them so much? Um, so I just wanted to. Yeah, this was always the question of, of Panchali's former boss. <laughs> so, when we say that, okay, we, we found these and these and these in our genes in our in our box, and and yeah, he asked, how do we know that they are really they are really functioning there? We don't know, just okay. because it's there. That's true, but if you if you if you find something interesting, you can go after it. Yeah, yeah, right. No, I didn't want to uh, interrupt you at all. Uh, please go ahead. Please interrupt me. Please, just it's it's okay. Uh, okay. So then, and 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 the ideal word would be to to continuously combine experimental and bioinformatics projects uh, to to feedback from one to the other and and shape a huge uh, project. Uh, 
with combining both approaches. I, 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 I feel that somehow my project, my recent project is a bit like this because I was able to feedback quite a lot of things to the, the lab, which uh, came out as a result from, from the bioinformatics analysis. Okay, uh, this is this is the uh, the frightening slide. So this is what you have to know what to do by informatics, <laughs> and this is just the basic tool set. Okay, so let's go through. Of course, this will be covered. All of these will be covered in 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 our meetings in the future in this uh, bioinformatics course. That's that's one of the main goal of this course to give you an idea on all of these. So many of these uh, algorithm software packages are running in command line. So you have to know how to use a Linux or Unix command line. Uh, and you have to have access to a command line as well, which is if you have a Mac based computer or a Linux machine, it's easy. If you have a Windows machine, then I will help how to uh, make command line on that one. Uh, in many cases, it's very good to know what kind of hardware do you are using and what is the operating system behind. In many cases, there are different uh, binary builds from programs. So you have to download that one, which is good for your operating system, which is easy if you have to choose between Linux and, and, and Mac OS. But if you have to choose between different types of Linux operating systems or different architectures of of Linux operating systems, then it's a bit more tricky. So you have to know what are you using. Oh yeah, for the command line, sorry. I forget that uh, uh, sooner or later you have to know how to how to run uh, scripts on the on the high performance cluster. So on a, a, a supercomputer, because you cannot really run everything in your own laptop or your own small server. That's, that's why the HPC is there. Uh, and also it's very important to know uh, what are your limits in terms of hardware. If you have enough space on the hard drive, if you have enough memory in the computer, how many CPU cores you have. These are all very, very important things when you start doing bioinformatics because if a program can run on multiple cores, then instead of running for four hours in one CPU core, you can run it for one hour in four CPU cores. Uh, you have to understand how you can install the program. Sometimes you have to compile it from the source. We will try to find some examples for this later. Uh, one of the most common way nowadays to install bioinformatics software is using Conda, Anaconda, Miniconda, any of these programs, it's very, very convenient because it will install everything you need for that particular program. But there are uh, uh, dangers with, by using Conda as well. Uh, another way is to use Docker. Docker is actually is making kind of small, like a virtual machine within the machine. So you have your own file system uh, where you can be an administrator. That's the most one of the most important things with, with Docker that you can, you have admin rights, so you can do much more things. And also there are software repositories like Git, what we will use later on. Uh, you have to do basic programming, not because for any of these algorithms you need programming, but because the output of these algorithms, of these bioinformatics programs will be a bit different from what you really want as an output. And if it's if it's 100 lines, then you can do it in Excel. You can just reorganize the, the columns and, and calculate the means or a standard deviation. But if you have millions of lines, then Excel is not capable of handling the data. So you have to learn one programming language with a, with a, with a very basic level. And there are some programming languages here. I think we will use R during this course, just because it's very, it's, it's absolutely cross-platform and you can easily see your uh, results uh, 
very quickly in R. But I will try to, to teach you programming in a way which is not very R specific. So I will teach you all the basic structures, the, the basic principles of programming. And as soon as you understand that, it's one day or two days and you can do it in a different programming language because you only have to learn the syntax, which is a bit different that you have to use curly brackets instead of columns or something like that. So it's, it's not really different. You have to understand the, the basic structure of programming. Uh, you have to know what kind of uh, file types you can have. Uh, so uh, you, it's like just simple tab separated values or comma separated values, how an XML, XML file looks like, how FASTA file or FASTQ file looks like, because you will work with these files, you will parse these files within your scripts. And sometimes you have to know a few about databases. I think I will speak about that as well. Uh, there are many databases or data sets you can download in a simple text-based format, but sometimes it's only available in XML and sometimes it's only available in, in an SQL format, which is much more advanced to work with than a text-based data. And finally, because you will generate a lot of temporary and uh, hopefully final results, you have to have good visualization skills. Uh, we will go with the R and ggplot, but if someone likes MATLAB, I understand. I don't like because it's paid and you have to pay for that software. Uh, sooner or later, if you do more than just simple bioinformatics or basic bioinformatics, uh, you will try and you have to try to understand the algorithms behind the software. Uh, I don't say I understand everything. Uh, I, I wouldn't be able to program a blast. Uh, I would be able to program something like that, but I don't exactly know everything uh, that uh, is working behind what you see from blast. But in, in, in many cases for being completely sure that you have a real dialogical answer, you have to understand what was the method that resulted in that biological answer. And yeah, this is the last one, is just that you have to rewire your thinking. How do you, how do you design and conduct your, your projects? You have to uh, come out from the lab comfort zone and go into the nerdy zone a little bit. Uh, there are only a few slides left, I think. Uh, so this is just, again, very general, but we will come back to this every time as when we will discuss some kind of area or some kind of software package, how to, how to choose your software or, or database for your project. You have to read a lot. You have to read what other people used. And luckily in bioinformatics, we have these benchmark papers. So every two or three years, there is a group who is sometimes asked or sometimes just do it themselves. Uh, then they compare the recent uh, methods for exactly the same purpose. And they check what is the uh, false positive, false negative rates. You can see the rock curves in these benchmark articles. So it's a, it's a very good source for choosing uh, which program do you have to do you want to use uh, i always prefer those software and also database of course data for databases this is way much more important it has regular updates that means that it's not just someone did that program or data set once and then use it if you want but really they, are, they, they care about uh, the changes in file formats, they care about new sequencing platforms, they care about new uh, methods to, to, to see a, a protein structure, and they are updating their programs frequently. This is, this is usually a very good sign uh, for choosing a program. You can always ask people uh, personally, or you can ask just Google, 
uh, or you can ask, for example, there are many questions we, we see on, on research kit when you want to do something and you just simply ask the question and there will be someone who will answer who already did that and who already know how to do it and which program is the most appropriate. Uh, yeah, the next point is, so in, in bioinformatics you can, there are many cases when you can choose a program which does the same, program A and program B, but program A uh, is doing a much more deep analysis and gives you much more results, which you would think, oh, that's, that's good. That's, that's generate more results. But if that means that it will run four times more and you have 100 samples or 100 data points, data sets you have to analyze and with method B, it's one day per sample. With method A, it's four days or two or two and a half days. Then it's a huge loss in time. And maybe you don't need that kind of detailed answer. Maybe you just can uh, have your bi uh, the answer for your biological question with the, with, the, with the faster one. So this is again a bit more about try to understand what the program does and try to understand what the output is. You always see what the output is because you can always run a toy data set and see what you can get back at the end. Uh, yeah, I think that's, that's what that. And yeah, this is again, one of my, my problems with, with, with the new and trendy and sexy algorithms. Uh, for example, artificial intelligence and neural network. Yes, you can use artificial intelligence and, and neural networks and deep learning for a lot of things, but just because it's now trending doesn't mean that it's better than a hidden Markov model, which is there for, I don't know how many decades. So don't choose an algorithm just because it's using something which is sounds much, much better than uh, something which is a bit older. Use the one which is robust and, and very reliable. And I think this is the last slide, maybe. So this is just a, uh, a few best practices. I think it's, it's also good if, if you keep these in, in mind during the course. It's always good to record your work. Uh, when you work in command line, your comments are saved in, in, a, in a specific file. I will show you. Uh, that file later on. It depends on your settings in, in your terminal. If it's at the last 100, last 500, or last 1000 comments. But if you are working a lot, then even 1000 can run out and, and you will lose your, your history quickly. So you won't be able to go back uh, too long to see what you did like one or two years ago. So it's always good to record what you are doing. You can always just open a text file, com copy your comment there and make a comment that I did it. I did this because I wanted to analyze this data and get this result. Uh, you always have to record the version of the software or the database you use if you don't. And if you publish, that will be one of the guaranteed questions of the reviewers. Even if it's not important, they will ask. They will ask what was the version number of your software and what was the date or the version of your database. And if you didn't record it, uh, then, then you have to make up <laughs> a number, which is not the best. Uh, the reason why you have to do this is because this is how other people can uh, replicate your work. I mean, this is where reproduce your work. Uh, in many cases, the same software uh, with a new version will give you a slightly different result, not very different, but slightly different result. And again, if you think about those kind of pipelines where you have five, six different uh, uh, programs on, the, on, on a chain, and you just change, you're just changing the very first one, and the very first one gives you a slightly different result and it can be amplified at the end and gives and give a, a very different uh, end product at the end. 
very, very important to keep your source, your raw data safe and well organized, at least as important to keep your minus 80 freezers <laughs> well organized. You have to back up your data uh, because this is this, this is the, the most important uh, part of, of bioinformatics, the raw data. Um, it's, it's very important not to be disturbed by the everyday work of bioinformatics. And this is why I put the next point here. If you feel that one of the programming languages you started learning is, is, is a bit weird, you don't like it, it's, you don't really read the programming language, uh, then you can just simply change and go to another one, which is a bit more clear, more uh, understandable for you. The same with text editors. I, I spent quite a lot of days to find a text editor which can color the, uh, the syntax how I like, which can uh, communicate with the server easily. So again, these are those things which you don't really want to your brain to work on. You want your brain to work on your on your biological problem, not on what kind of uh, editors and visualization tools you are using. So this is very important to choose at the beginning, and then uh, you won't have any problem with that. Uh, when you will write scripts, I will show you how you should comment your scripts. You should say almost every in every line, why did you do that? Uh, I should say this to myself as well because I, I always forget to comment my scripts. But if you if you get used to commenting your scripts in the very beginning, then you will be very very happy if you go back to your two years old script and you will understand why those lines are there. Uh, in bioinformatics, you are very often uh, produce temporary files. Uh, they can eat up quite a lot of space from, from your hard drive. So it's very easy to just to simply to, to delete them because, because you can always reproduce them. The problem is that uh, sometimes you need days to reproduce these temporary files. And if you find out five steps later that you have something, you need something else from that temporary file, which you deleted, then you have to go back and wait two more days uh, to regenerate that temporary file. Uh, so I think the best practice is to to keep those files which uh, need a long time to produce again, at least until the end of your project. Then you can of course delete them, and you can delete those temporary files which are very easy to 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 re uh, make like five or ten minutes. And always try to share and discuss your ideas, even with those people who are not bioinformaticians or not doing bioinformatics. I'm discussing my ideas very often with my wife, uh, who is a neuroscientist, uh, just because when you are uh, giving your ideas to, uh, uh, to someone who is not involved in that uh, project, uh, you new ideas or uh, can, can come out from it, or they can say it's a stupid idea. Uh, 